Welcome to the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. We've been presenting the message of freedom and grace in Christ for over 30 years. The legacy of the ministry spans every state in the U.S. and reaches into over 140 countries internationally. We're glad that by listening, you're joining the extended family of Lifetime Guarantee. Two things before we begin. First, after you've listened to this teaching, we encourage you to share this MP3 with your friends. Second, your financial contribution will assist us in making more of the ministry available to others. This is so important. You can make a donation at Lifetime.org. That's Lifetime.org. address the topic, a study of the mind. And to do so, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. You know, there is um, a great principle which runs throughout the Bible, nearly from cover to cover, I guess. That great principle is what we have been calling throughout this seminar the principle of identification. That is that when Jesus Christ went to the cross and was crucified, that we were identified by the Father as being in Him, that when He died, I died. That is, that that old uh, sin-loving self was crucified. And then that as Jesus Christ was buried, that I was identified in His burial. When He resurrected, I resurrected in Him a brand new person, a new creation, as 2 Corinthians 5 says it. And then, after he had uh, spent about 40 days or so here on this earth, then he ascended, took his seat at the right hand of the Father, and that I ascended in him and am now seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father. A great principle of identification. In addition, then, there are two pervading truths that run throughout the uh, course of the Bible. That first truth is that at salvation, Jesus Christ came to dwell inside of me. He lives inside of me as a result of my salvation. The second pervading truth is that as a result of my salvation, not only does He reside in me, but I live in Him. So Christ in me and me in Christ two pervading truths that follow throughout the Bible and a great principle of identification. These two topics are something that Paul is going to address in Colossians 3. I'd like for us to look at that passage uh, in Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1, and we'll uh, read through verse 17. And then we'll come back and talk about that and uh, look at it pretty closely. Once we have uh, kind of torn it apart and evaluated it, then we'll back off and see if we can't put some practical understanding to what Paul has written to the the church at Colossae. So let's read through this, and then we'll kind of go back and take it a verse at a time. Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead, to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. 
a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now let's break that down and kind of piece it together here, and then we'll, like I said, look at it in a practical sense. The first two verses, I think, kind of uh, fit together in my mind. Uh, Paul is kind of laying out his case, if you will. First of all, he offers an exhortation, and that exhortation is that you have been raised. I believe that he is alluding to that great principle that we were discussing, that principle of identification. As Christ was raised, you have been raised also. Then I believe that um, following his exhortation, he gives us an encouragement, an encouragement to seek the things that are above. I believe um, another way to say that would be an encouragement to walk in the Spirit, to walk in Channel 2, uh, playing upon the, um, the first lecture in this uh, series that we've been doing. And then thirdly, I believe he offers an entreaty. First an exhortation, then an encouragement, thirdly an entreaty. And that entreaty is to set your mind on things above. I think that that is an urgent statement, a statement uh, with, a, with an imperative kind of a nature. Paul, I don't believe, is trying to express any kind of, of possibility or probability He's only wishing to express intention. In other words, uh, you might paraphrase it like this. Paul would say, I intend for you to set your mind on a moment-by-moment -moment basis upon the things that are above. I guess the real heart of things, uh, if we could kind of put it into a concise statement this evening, could be verbalized in this statement. Spiritual battles are won or lost at the threshold of the mind, not in the mind. Spiritual battles are won or lost at the threshold of the mind, not in the mind. Now in Colossians 3, uh, or excuse me, Colossians 3, verse 3, uh, Paul kind of, I, get, I think, gives his reasoning for making the statements that he does in the first two verses. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I think that's a statement uh, that it's a, it's a causal statement. Because you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, then set your mind on the things that are above. Going on then, down there to uh, verse 5, he says, uh, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Now, why is that? Uh, why are we told to consider the members of our earthly body as dead? Because they're dead, right? In verse 3, you have died, and your life is hidden with God. Now, it is with this statement that I believe Paul begins to uh, lay out for us the procedure, if you will, to how to set your mind on things above. It's going to be kind of a two-step process. First of all, we are going to be told to set our minds on our death and burial in Christ. And he's going to deal with that in verses 5 through 9. And then in verses 10 through 17, he's going to tell us about setting our minds on our resurrection and our ascension in Christ. So verse 5, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. And then he gives us this list of garbage there 
immorality and impurity and passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, I think it's significant there that he uh, kind of picks up on uh, what he said in verse 3. You have died. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead. In verse 7, he stresses this. You once walked in these things. You were living in these things. As I began to study this passage and prepare uh, this topic, I got down to verse 8 and it was kind of confusing to me. But now you also put them all aside. It almost sounded as if uh, this was some sort of an encouragement from Paul that I was... Uh, that I was supposed to kind of suck it up and finish a job that had kind of been half done in verse 5. Verse 5, all those things have been taken care of, but verse 8, it's almost as if, okay, now then, press, I've started it for you. You take care of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and so on. Well, I, uh, I found that difficult to deal with, and so I began to study that verse. And what I came up with was, uh, was this that that, um, that little word there, put, uh, in the Greek, that's an aorist tense, an aorist tense, referring to uh, simply just a point in time, no particular point in time, really, until you begin to evaluate what kind of a use that is. Now, I believe the use of that aorist is what's called a culminative aorist, culminative uh, coming from our word culmination, signifying the end of something. Now, culminative aorists are things that um, are used with verbs of process, verbs of effort, and that's what we've got here. Put them all aside, a verb of effort, uh, a process kind of a thing. And the significance of linking that idea of culmination and that aorist together are that, um, that the reader is supposed to view it from its existing results. Uh, from the culmination point. So, in other words, I think that we would be safe uh, in our minds to look at this and understand that he's really saying, hey, you have put these things aside. I simply am putting verse 8 here to reinforce what I've already told you in verse 5. This is a tremendously important point. So I'm going to repeat myself in a sense. Now I got to verse 9. And uh, it was confusing to me as well. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self. And I immediately asked myself the question, well, what does lying have to do with having laid aside the old self? So I began to think about, uh, well, uh, the way that many of us operate a lot of times as Christians. And you know it's sad to say, I guess, but, but a lot of times I find that Christians spend spend uh, spend their time identifying themselves by the characteristics in verses 5 and 8. Uh, immoral things and impure things, uh, things which would uh, indicate evil desires and greeds and idolatries and anger and wrath and so on. And that's how they identify themselves. And the force of what Paul is trying to say is, hey, you have died. To those things. Those things are no longer typical of you. You have become a new person. You've laid aside this old self. So don't go around lying to one another, claiming to be characterized by these ungodly things here, when in reality you have become a brand new person. The thing which was characterized by those ungodly characteristics in verses 5 and 8 has been laid aside. So don't lie to one another about your true identity. Instead, talk to, talk to each other about who you really are, what your true identity and your true nature really are all about. And of course, as we've already seen and studied, uh, we have become new creatures. We are saints by calling, chosen by the Father as being holy and blameless before Him. And it's at this point in verse 10 that Paul begins to launch in then to the idea of our resurrection and ascension in Christ. He starts off, You have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Now I want you to note something interesting here. You have put on the new self. 
a statement of fact. A statement uh, indicating that this is the way things really are. You've put on the new self. Then he follows it up by saying, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. In other words, he is indicating something that is experiential at this point. He's indicating something that is a, a procedure in a way. Alluding, I think, to what the uh, situation is that you and I live in here on this planet, this laboratory that we call Earth. He has called us something, a new self, a new man, but he has left us here in this environment filled with anxieties and tensions and things that catch us off guard and so on in order to give us an opportunity to trust the Lord, to walk in obedience to Him, to walk in the Spirit, and in so doing, to experientially come to understand who we really are as a result of our identification in the resurrection and, of, and ascension in Christ. Now, in verses 11 on down through 17, Paul simply refers to the many different attributes that are ours as new creatures in Christ. Um, he exhorts us to, um, uh, in verse 12, to put on a heart of compassion as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. In verse 14, he, uh, he discusses this perfect bond of unity which is to be characteristic of us in Christ. And he winds the whole thing up then in verse 17 saying, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. In other words, a consistent kind of a daily walk, uh, trusting the Lord Jesus, uh, looking to him, and so on. Now, it's not until verse 18 that Paul ever begins to discuss with us performance. But in verse 18, he really begins to discuss performance. He says at that point, wives, be subject. Verse 19, husbands, love. Children, be obedient. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Slaves, in all things, obey. Verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Now, I think it's significant that this chapter is laid out in the order that it's laid out in. You see, if he had put verse 18 in the place of verse 1 and begun by saying, wives be subject, husbands love, children be obedient, fathers do not exasperate, and so on, then in essence, he would have been strapping some sort of a law trip on us without telling us from what perspective we should be doing these things. But instead, how does he begin? He begins with an exhortation, an encouragement, and then an entreaty, an exhortation about our uh, identity in him, our location in Christ. Uh, an exhortation to walk in the Spirit, and then an entreaty to set our minds upon the things above, to focus on those things. And then I think that Paul uh, was resting assured that as long as the reader was being obedient to those things, then the appropriate Christian performance would very naturally follow out of people who had hearts for wanting to be obedient to God as the new people that they really were in Christ and really are in Christ for us. Now, the emphasis of this whole thing as far as I'm concerned then is how do we get down to the practicalities of this thing? I see here in Colossians 3 that it is imperative that I set my mind on things above. In fact, if I really am in agreement with what Paul has said and what the other passages of scriptures that we've pointed out have said about uh, this principle of identification, then it is vital to my well-being that I learn how to set my mind on the things above in order to practically put this Christian life into action. So how do you go about it? 
Well, I've come up with um, some little ideas here to try to communicate this principle for us. And I've dreamed up some words to help us remember these things as we go along. The first of these words is the word recognize. Recognize. Recognize the origin of the thoughts. If I am to learn how to set my mind on the things above, it is vital that I learn how to recognize the origin of the thought. Now you will uh, understand right off that I'm referring to how can I pinpoint when this thing called the law of sin, which dwells in my members and which we looked at in, under the topic of truth, the door to victory, how can I identify that law of sin when he speaks to me? disguised as that old self, speaking to me with first-person pronouns, I, me, and myself. In my case, masculine tone of voice, a Texas accent. For you, Georgia accents. How can you identify that guy when he speaks his temptation, his deception, or his accusation to you? Well, let me give you two principles that I have found to be kind of helpful from time to time. The first principle would be this. Satan attacks you as a person and me as a person. He attacks me in my personhood, my identity, because of some poor performance. Now, um, for those who would be sitting out there and uh, you have hard charger flesh, uh, perfectionist flesh, if you will, and uh, one of these days over here, your performance falls apart uh, at, jo at the job or something, then there would come a temptation to you and it would be verbalized like this. How stupid could I be? What an ignorant move. What a dummy. I can't believe I'm such an idiot. When am I ever going to learn how to, to keep track of these things and not make these stupid mistakes? Boy, I hope nobody saw this. They'll think I'm such an idiot. All those things being verbalized toward me, first-person pronouns, masculine tone of voice, Texas accent, perfectly correlated with whatever my fleshly habit pattern might be. In this case, hard charger flesh. If I've got rejected kind of flesh, then my, uh, the uh, temptations are going to be, I'm such a worthless, no good. I tell you, I don't know why anybody would love me. I don't know why they would have anything to do with me. So the crux of the matter then is how do I go about setting my mind on the things above in a practical kind of a sense? The first thing that I want us to realize is this, that the setting of the mind is something that I do as an act of my will. It affects my mind, not necessarily my emotions. The nature of Paul's statement in verse 2 of Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, is an imperative kind of a mood. That's what it's called in, in the Greek language. The imperative mood is classed along with the, uh, with the moods of improbability. Not because Paul does not mean business when he states this, but it's put in the moods of improbability because it requires something that, uh, that Paul is not in control of as he makes that statement. And the thing that he's not in control of is my personal will. All he can do is exhort me to set my mind on the things above. I must choose then to set my mind on things above. How do I go about that? Well, I've come up with four words to try to illustrate that. All of them begin with R in hopes that we can remember them a little better. So here's the first of them. Recognize. Recognize the origin of the thoughts. How do I recognize the origin of the thought? I would like to share with you maybe two practical, simple tools that would be helpful with regard to recognizing the origin of the thought. The first tool would be this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, 
there's a very familiar passage which begins like this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that issue of condemnation will be the first thing that will be a, uh, a key to how I go about recognizing the origin of the thoughts. You see, when Satan offers a temptation to me, many times he will condemn me. Condemn me as a person because of something that I have done over here in my performance. He will condemn me because of what I have done. On the other hand now, God will never condemn me because he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He will, however, convict or condemn poor performance, if you want to use that word. Convict is the word we usually hear more about. So Satan will condemn me as a person because of what I do. God, on the other hand, will convict me of poor performance. But he will leave my personhood intact, recognizing what he himself has done in my life in Christ Jesus. Now then, if I, um, if I have lived on this planet and I've come up with a rejected kind of flesh, the kinds of statements that Satan is going to be making to me on a regular basis will be stuff like, I feel like I'm such a worthless, no good, or, um, or, uh, or boy, I, I feel so unloved. Um, you know, if, if I could only get somebody to love me. Or maybe, maybe you've got this hard charger kind of flesh, perfectionistic kind of flesh, and the kinds of statements that would be coming to you would be things, uh, you know, in light of poor performance, would be things like, oh, how stupid could I be? What an idiot I am. Things which would be condemning to you as an individual, as a person, because of something that you have done. Those would be the kinds of temptations that Satan would throw to you. Now then, a second tool that would give us a key on how to recognize the origin of the thoughts. Look with me, if you will, over a few pages to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And let's look at verses 10 and 11. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, of what significance are those verses in my mind? The significance that I would like for us to see there is the power that is associated with the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. An ultimately powerful name. What do you suppose would happen if we use that name to evaluate each and every thought that came our, our, our way? In other words, when a thought comes, we just tack on these three words at the end of the thought. In Jesus' name. So the thought comes, I'm such a worthless person in Jesus' name. I'm such an idiot in Jesus' name. I wish somebody loved me in Jesus' name. I feel, I feel like such a failure in Jesus' name. What's happening inside you? Do you feel kind of a, a grating in there, kind of a sanding, a, an uncomfortableness? Why is that? That's because God's Spirit is speaking to you and saying, wait a minute, something isn't jiving in here. Uh, this isn't lining up with the Word of God. And the very name of Jesus is the thing that's bringing that incongruency to the surface. On the other hand, let's uh, evaluate these thoughts. I am a saint by calling in Jesus' name. I've been chosen holy and blameless in Jesus' name. I have been redeemed in Jesus' name, justified in Jesus' name. 
Um, I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus' name. I always walk in Christ's triumph in Jesus' name. And on and on we could go. Do you feel, uh, do you feel something that's, that's kind of meshing and saying, yeah, that's right. That's fitting with what I know to be found in the pages of this book. In other words, God's Spirit is witnessing to your spirit saying, yes, this is truth. And the thing that has brought the realization to you is that name, in Jesus' name. So I would encourage you then to use that name, the name of Jesus, to evaluate each and every thought that comes your way. And in so doing then, you will develop a sophistication for determining the origination of these thoughts. And as you begin to do that, through the power of the Spirit and the use of that name, Jesus, you'll begin to recognize the origin of those thoughts and see them as coming either from the law of sin or else coming to you via the Holy Spirit, God's agent in your life. Well, the second word that I want us to look at, representing the second concept, is refuse. Refuse to accept the thoughts as mine. Refuse to accept the thoughts as mine. Now, the verse of Scripture that I think would uh, typify this very well is found in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Again, a very familiar verse. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. And obviously, the word that I want to key in on there is the word let. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So where's your letter? Well, your letter is your will, isn't it? It's the same thing as your chooser, that thing that you make decisions with. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. As I began to try to think of some way to give an example of this, I thought of when my wife and I were just um, engaged. We were not yet married, and I was living in Fort Worth, and she was living in Kentucky. Now, my daily routine is that I, uh, I get up, go in, take a shower, um, then after my shower, I go in, study, eat a little breakfast, and then off to work. Now, I uh, would get up many mornings, go in, get in the shower, and I'd just be minding my own business in there, and all of a sudden, all these thoughts would start coming to me. I like to call it a case of the what ifs, and this is the way it would go. What if Becky doesn't really love me? What if I don't really love her? What if she's not really the right one for me? What if I'm not the right one for her? What if she finds another guy over there in Kentucky? Or what if I find another girl here in Fort Worth? What if we get married and this isn't, uh, this just doesn't work out or something? What if she doesn't really love the Lord like I think she loves the Lord? What if she hampers my ministry or something? I mean, you name it, it got asked to me right there in the shower. Well, one day I was a little more alert than another day, I guess, and I began to say, well, now what in the world's happening? Where are all these thoughts coming from? All these questions, uh, they're all demeaning kinds of things. They're, they're bringing into question the integrity of my wife-to-be. They're bringing into question my integrity. They're bringing into question the things that God has said to me through His Word and, and through His Spirit about this, this marriage that I'm about to enter into here. Furthermore, none of these questions are answerable. I began to recognize the origin of those thoughts, and it was at that point that I began to refuse. Now, here's how I did it. I gritted my teeth, and I said, No, no. I recognize where these thoughts are coming from, and I refuse to accept them as mine. They're coming from the enemy, not me. They're not mine upon which to dwell. You just take your thoughts and you keep them. I'm not going to think about them. And I begin then instead to set my mind on other things. 
So then, to summarize, how do you refuse to accept the thoughts as yours? You grit your teeth and you say no. In other words, you really mean business when you say no. In other words, it's not a Casper Milk Toast kind of a no. You say a no that you mean, right? The third concept, I reckon myself to be dead to sin. I reckon myself dead to sin. Now, reckon is not a word that we use an awful lot anymore, but it means to consider something to be so. Now, I reckon myself to be dead to sin. Look up one verse from where you are there in Romans 6 to verse 11. Romans 6, 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. In other words, you are refusing to accept the thoughts as, as mine. In other words, I am pretending to be a dead person. Why am I pretending that? because that's what I really am. God has already said that in His Word. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God, right? Colossians 3.3. 3. So I'm going to reckon myself, I'm going to consider myself to be dead to sin. Now, how do I go about doing that? Well, I'd like to share with you three concepts, three battlefronts, if you will, upon which spiritual battles occur or upon which temptations occur. First of all, the first front is that uh, you will uh, recognize uh, temptation after the fact, okay? After the fact. You've already blown it. You've already sinned. And all of a sudden, you're just going to recognize, oh, my soul, I've been walking after the flesh. So you're going to recognize sin after the fact. Or secondly, you will uh, recognize sin uh, in the act. You'll catch sin's temptation in the act. Thirdly, before the act ever occurs. So after the fact, caught in the act, and before the fact. Now let's talk about each of those three. First of all, after the fact. Now the things that we're sharing this week are uh, practical principles on how to live the Christian life. These things are going to be things that are developed in your life as you walk and trust the Lord Jesus. As at the inception of this walk, there are going to be many times and many other times along the way after a period of time where you're just going to wake up one day and you're going to say, oh my soul, I've been blowing it. I've been walking after the flesh in this area. And it's going to be a, an area where you've sinned. And you're going to have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I confess to you that I have been blowing it, uh, that I've been sinning, and I choose to repent, to turn 180 degrees, to go the other direction. I'm sorry, dear Father. Now then, you repent, uh, you confess, you repent. Now how do you go about, if possible, taking that situation of sin and using it to your benefit? Is that possible? I believe it is. Look over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now I'm going to key in on verse 11, but I want to pick it up with verse 9 to kind of uh, get the context of this verse. 2 Corinthians 7, beginning with verse 9. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Now then, let's key in on this. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Now let me uh, illustrate this and then we'll come back and pick that verse apart just a bit. All right, you've sinned in some fashion. You've blown it. Give yourself uh, some time to recover a little bit. That is, some time for the emotions to relax, to come down a little bit. 
then go in and sit down in your easy chair or, or some neutral kind of a spot where, where you can be safe in a sense, where you can be by yourself and alone for a moment. Sit down there and begin to think through what happened to you. Get your diagram out, uh, that diagram of channel one and channel two. Start down there, what was the world system? What, what was the situation that, uh, that occurred? What was it that the enemy said to me through the law of sin? What was the temptation? How was it verbalized? Those, look for those first-person pronouns, that masculine or feminine voice and that George accent. What fleshly pattern was this temptation correlated with? And, and just think it through step by step. Then as you work your way through that diagram, begin to see that thought progress on into the mind. And see the mind then and the emotions become involved as they throw that temptation or pass that temptation on to will to make a decision as to whether or not you are going to reject this thought as yours and in so doing to walk in victory or you're going to accept this thought as yours, thus buy it and walk after deception. And at that critical point where you see that you made your mistake, if you want to call it that, and you sinned, then in your fantasy, if you will, see yourself make the correct decision. Go back and, if you will, in your fantasy, kind of correct that mistake. You see, an avenging of a wrong. You're going back and you're retracing your steps. You're learning from what uh, you, from where you failed. In that, uh, in that circumstance. Now let's look at the passage again. Uh, verse 11, Behold what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, which will be yours after this uh, sin is recognized, what earnestness this godly sorrow has produced in you. In other words, because of this new creation that you are, when you recognize this sin, there's going to be something inside that says, Oh my soul, I hate this. I despise this. I, I more than anything want to put my finger on how to keep from walking after the flesh in this area again. What vindication of yourselves. In other words, I'm going to go back and look at this thing and as I trust the Holy Spirit by the grace of God, I am going to learn how to spot this temptation before I walk after it again in the future. In other words, I'm going to learn how from this experience to catch sin in the act or before the act the next time. What fear? Not in the sense of fear and trembling, but in the sense of respect. Respect for the war that you're facing, the warfare that's going on. What longing? What zeal? In other words, what a motivator. What a motivator to walk in the Spirit, to be, a, uh, to be pleasing and obedient to the Father whom you desire more than anything else to, uh, to please. All right, there will be those times where you will catch sin in the act. In other words, you'll say, oh, my soul, here it is. A sin has been served up to me. What do I do? Well, back to Romans 6.12. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Choose to refuse, if you will, to refuse to accept that thought as yours. In other words, a teeth-gritted denial that you are going to follow after this thought and accept it as yours. And then the third front that we mentioned was catching temptation before the fact of it ever being offered to you. Turn with me quickly to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Philippians 4, 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Practice these things. In other words... Uh, through the basic seminar that you all have attended, through some of the previous lectures in this seminar, you should be sitting there with some idea of what your unique version of the flesh happens to be. 
whatever your unique version of the flesh happens to be, those are the primary areas that you can expect to be tempted in on a day-to-day -day kind of a basis. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that if you have a fleshly pattern for feeling inferior, that on Sunday morning when you come to church in your 10-year-old dress and you sit next to the lady who has on a brand new mink coat, that you can bank on it that sin's going to offer up to you a temptation to feel inferior. Right? Now, if you come to church once a week, four times a month, uh, however many times that is a year, uh, then pretty soon you're going to get the hang of it that, hey, one of the places that I really get my teeth kicked in regularly is sitting in the pew in my own church. So what am I going to start doing on Monday morning? I'm going to begin setting my mind on my true identity. I'm not inferior. I'm inferior in Jesus' name. No, that doesn't fit. Now what does uh, Galatians 3.28 say? It says that I am one with the body of Christ. Now, there's no uh, inferiority in the body of Christ if we're all one, is there? Why, no. So I'm going to set my mind on the a true identity that I have in Christ. So then I reckon myself to be dead to sin through practicing these things that I have seen. The last word then is rest. Rest in the fact that that I am in Christ and that Christ is in me. Rest in the fact that I am in Christ and that Christ is in me. Now, I don't know of any better illustration that I could give you uh, to illustrate how to rest in Christ than that teaching that Mom mentioned the other night entitled Resting in Jesus. You remember she began with an envelope that had God written on it, and she quoted to you John chapter 14, verse 20. In that day you shall know that I, Jesus, am in my Father and that you, press, are in me and that I, Jesus, am in you. For anything then to get to me, it must first pass through God through Jesus in order to get to me, and when it gets to me, it finds me filled with Jesus. So then, in light of that understanding, what is there for me to be afraid of? Can I rest in that knowledge? Can I rest in that knowledge? Why, sure I can. Why, sure I can. As long as I choose to set my mind on the things that are above. Now, let me encourage you to do something. I've got these official envelopes up here. I painted those up special just for the occasion. But I've got this one up here, and um, if you could get up here and look at it, you'd see that it's kind of wrinkled up and soiled and so on. Because uh, this is my envelope. Mom's got her envelopes, and I guess in a way that, that this is your envelope in a sense. But this is mine. Let me encourage you to get yourself your own envelope. And uh, this envelope's got a flap on the back of it. Let me ask you to lick it and seal it because the Bible says that we've been sealed in the Spirit, right? So get your own envelope, okay? Finally then, as, as we kind of bring this thing to a close, I want you to look at one... Well, never mind, don't look. Let me read it to you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. You read it when you get home. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It goes like this. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Now then, you should have some things that are true tucked away in your computer or in your notes. You should have some things that are honorable that you know about you. You should have some things that you know are right and pure and lovely and are of good repute. And if so, let your mind dwell on those things. Now before I close, let me tell you about that word dwell. It's written in the present tense. 
And I believe that its use is iterative. We kind of get our word reiterate from that word. It's an iterative present, I think. And what does that mean? That means that I am to let my mind dwell and continue dwelling at successive intervals on these things. To let my mind dwell, to continue to dwell at successive intervals on these things that are true, honorable, pure, and of good repute with regard to me. We hope you've been encouraged by the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. You can find similar resources, messages, and articles at lifetime.org. We have a wealth of information on marriage, parenting, depression, overeating, freedom and identity in Christ, as well as men's and women's issues. You'll find a complete catalog at lifetime.org. Two quick reminders before we conclude. Feel free to share this MP3 with others, especially those you know who might need it. Do so with our encouragement and blessing. And we would sincerely appreciate your financial assistance in making the ministry available to more people. Just go to lifetime.org, and you'll find a secure way to support Lifetime Guarantee on the homepage. And finally, we pray God's blessings for you.